I'm going to be on your back the whole game too, you punk. Yeah, but you're going to feel it, Cooley. I'm telling you, you're going to feel it. I told you to keep that camera running. You might miss him. We're going to be in your face and letting you know the real talk. And welcome to the Not For Long Pro Football Show. Noah Groniger, Clint Schweitzer. We thought our Kansas City Chiefs were in good position, and they drop a one. They lay a stinker. They lay an egg against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I was going to come on here and rant right after the game. I left the game. I was in my car. I was like, I'm going to rant. I'm going to go off. And the more I kept going, I'm like, this is the Chiefs. This is this organization. I just give up. I'm not going to rant. I just don't care anymore. What what are your thoughts? All right, well, first off, happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there. And I know that football and uh, you know Thanksgiving are synonymous with each other, man. And going back, uh, my my formative years, always the TV always on. Uh, one year, my I believe my aunt said, "Let's just turn the volume down while we eat," and we said, "No way." With regards to the Chiefs, I think that um, you become numb to it. And we're yeah. sitting here. Um, we talked after the game. The Kansas City Chiefs are what they are. When you are in the situation where uh, the quarterback position continues to hurt you year in and year out. This offense has just never gotten off the ground all year. It's been out of sync. Players missing, players hurt. The Chiefs, of course, would have key players hurt at the wrong time. When you've got D. Ford, you know Marcus Peters out of a game. Uh, you got Jeremy Macklin out of a game. You're just you're with Justin Houston's back, but at what degree was he even? He was playing patty cake out there, running around avoiding contact. Right now, the Chiefs are they're not in sync. They're not a team that looks poised to, to make a run at this division, especially with Oakland keeps doing. They keep winning. They keep finding a way to win. Um, the Chiefs play the Denver Broncos on Sunday night. Huge game. Uh, you shake your head. The Chiefs can go out and win this game, and the th- tides turn. If the Chiefs win this game at Denver, I like them to win the division again. I really do. Yeah, I mean, I've counted this team out to so many times throughout this Andy Reid era and just like, oh, there's no chance. And then they do come out with that win. I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Wow, I didn't th- I didn't see that coming. But uh, I really, really, really don't see it coming on Sunday Night Football at Denver. I mean, the whole world watching. We saw what happened last Sunday Night Football. The Steelers, uh, that wasn't pretty. So I expect something similar like that. Who knows if Marcus Peters will be able to go again. It sounds like Macklin won't be able to go. For the hamstring, even if he can go, how successful will he be? a week removed from that hamstring injury. Uh, I just don't see it. Justin Houston, just is his career over? Is he done? <laughs> I, I, it's possible. I said that same thing. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I mean, we're going to, and we're going to get into that. And I think that's only a hundred million dollars. Bye. the chiefs were seven and two, they're seven and three now still looking very good for as a playoff team. I don't know what that me- it means beyond that. I just don't. And we've said all along, this team needs to get a first round buy. It needs to be a one or two seed. Obviously one was a pipe dream. When you have the, the Patriots out there, at least a two seed would now, be a prayer. You're on, you're on a wild card path now, clearly. And that's what it is. That's what this is, has been under Andy Reid and Alex Smith. And you know what, to some extent, that's not bad, but you just want to take that next step. You want to get to the next level. I don't think Alex Smith's a quarterback that can get you to the next level. We've said that for four years. I'm tired of saying it. And <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you watch what guys like Dak Prescott are doing, you know Carson Wentz, the success he's having, the Chiefs' refusal to uh, you know acknowledge this position um, to, to, is is inexcusable, and that's what gets you this position right now. Andy Reid can go eight and eight, nine and seven, ten and six, get to wild card with Alex Smith all he wants. Chiefs fans deserve more, but you know what? Maybe they don't because they seem to just really take this in stride and go on to the next year nothing gets better this offense has done nothing but get worse under Andy Reid I don't don't get it next year will be our year oh we just need another wide receiver opposite Macklin we might need another safety this receiving core is horrible I'm telling you that right now it is I don't know what's going on with Chris Conley he looks open a few times but Alex just wants to go with the check down instead and then you've got Albert Wilson's and DeAnthony Thomas is running around out there you really notice when Macklin's not in the game that safety net for Alex Smith is gone Uh, but it is Thanksgiving we're coming up on Thanksgiving it's time to be thankful and uh, I guess the only thing I can say is I think I'm thankful that we're not the Browns. I, as am I. I think everyone can say that at 0-11. Thankful we're not the Browns. Uh, very good candidate to go winless here this season. I mean, what a disaster it's been for them. And I, you know, and, and we're gonna we have such a big guest coming up here exactly. on today's show yeah. in Ernest Biner, former uh, two-time Pro Bowler. Uh, he was with the Browns from '84 to '88. Was played in two AFC Championship games. The Browns haven't been the same since since.
since the Marty Schottenheimer era, and as we're putting together, Noah and I, um, a film for Marty Schottenheimer, who we found out yes. has uh, um, Alzheimer's. We're going to be putting together a film, and we're not sure where it's actually going to go yet. We've been in contact with many former players from Kansas City. Ernest Biner has been kind enough to come on this show to talk about his relationship with Marty and uh, to help us out with this project as well. And Ernest is just a guy that, I mean, he was just... And you're going to hear it in this interview, man. Ernest, is, he's the heart and soul. He's all passion and heart. He is. And he, he legitimately feels sad for the city of Cleveland, which is rare that someone takes yeah. that accountability because he did have a key fumble in the 87 AFC Championship game that uh, that went on to, to help cost them the game. But my goodness, what a player he was for them. A uh, 10th round draft pick that just rose to start him. He and Kevin Mack were a great one-two combination. Bernie Kozar, that offense was really good. Webster Slaughter as a receiver. Speaking of Webster Slaughter, he missed that block on the fumble on the outside corner, came in and stripped the ball. But uh, does Ernest Biner go there? Does he mention that? No. He he holds he accountability takes, for that. He more so than he probably should. Exactly. Because he had, if people don't remember, he had 120 yards receiving and 70 on the ground, two touchdowns in that game. They're not back in that game, if not for Ernest exactly. Biner. Marty Schottenheimer said that in uh, the film Believe Land, uh, where Ernest Biner gets a letter from a fan saying, you ruined my dream, and that, that really hurt Ernest. He took yeah. that and not just, oh, whatever, some fan said that. Whatever. No, he I don't took care. it to heart. Yeah. And I'll tell you, we're going to go ahead and welcome our good friend Ernest Biner to the show right now. We're talking more about uh, this Marty Schottenheimer project. Yeah. Ernest, man, welcome to the show. It's really good to talk to you. How's everything going? And it is our pleasure at this time to welcome our very special guest here on the Not For Long Pro Football Show. It is Ernest Biner, one of the great NFL running backs, 8,000 yards in his career. Ernest, welcome to the show, man. How's everything going out there, buddy? It's going, it's going good. Thank you for, uh, for having me on. Things are well. Uh, we are uh, always building, always trying to grow. So it's, uh, it's, 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 life is good. Absolutely. And we contacted you initially, Ernest. We've been, uh, you know, here at the Great American Sports Network. We're, um, you know, here in Kansas City, huge fans of when Marty Schottenheimer was here. And I want to start with that because I know you played for uh, Coach Schottenheimer uh, for, for his, his entire tenure there in Cleveland. He drafted you and until he left in 88. Uh, we're putting together this film, yeah. and we're just looking to get as many players as we can, former players of Marty's, together uh, to, to just kind of send us in videos, giving memories of Marty, because I know you, I'm sure you've heard about him having kind of the onset of, of, of uh, Alzheimer's and just how crippling that is, especially for such a, gr a great guy like Marty. And I know you just had so many good memories of, uh, of, of playing under Marty. No question. Um, I mean, we just recently had a celebration of the 86 team. Um, you know, that team went uh, 12 and 4, and you know, it, it, it began, though, in, in 84 when Marty took over about halfway during the season. And, you know, Marty, I mean, he's a father figure to me. I mean, I'm sure he liked that with a lot of guys. But, uh, you know, Marty took me on his wing. He, he you know, told me that he was dependent on me, that I was going to be his starting running back, that we were going to build when we were going to build, um, from, you know, from there. And, you know, Marty has, you know, his always taken care of, uh, of us as players, always been honest with me. He was always honest with me. He was always forthright. He was always holding us accountable and pushing us to, to higher heights, man. You only do that with people that uh, that you love and that you want to see their, that you want to see do their very best. And that's, you know, that's, you know, that's what you have with Marty. I mean, that's why he was successful wherever he was as a coach, you know, with the Browns, Kansas City, San Diego, when he went to Washington, they started off a little rocky, but he got back going, man. But to tell you the truth, Marty is a Hall of Fame guy to me. He's a father figure, but he's a Hall of Fame type of coach as well. Well, you, talking about your time in Cleveland, you guys fell short twice to the Denver Broncos, but then you went on and you did win, and you won two Super Bowls, one as a player for the Redskins, and then uh, – as the director of player development with the Baltimore Ravens, was that kind of bittersweet for you in any way? Kind of have winning winning those Super Bowls, but not doing it in Cleveland, where those fans just yearn for it. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, you know, obviously, you know, when you in Cleveland and you know they they hadn't had a championship since '64, but that wasn't a big deal. You know, when we were playing, you know, we were we were trying to do the absolute best that we can. You know, and the thing that we know about the Cleveland fans is that they they are loving and they are very loyal. And one of the things that that helped us to play at a high level on a continual basis year in and year out there was obviously the team was molded well with Mr. Modell, but Marty did an excellent job of 
of uh, cracking the whip on us when we needed, love, loving us when we when we didn't, but we still we didn't quite make it. So when I finally when I went to Washington and was able to get to the championship game and then get to the Super Bowl again and you know making it finally making it, yes, it was somewhat bittersweet, but. To tell you the truth, there were some guys that were from Cleveland that came to the came to the game to help make help help make it more of a uh, us thing. It was a Cleveland thing. It was still to me a Cleveland thing because of what Cleveland did for me, how they how they built me up, how they how they encouraged me. So that connection has has was then and is still there today. And one thing that we saw uh, in the in the recent documentary Believe Land was uh, a lot of emotion when talking about those uh, those AFC Championship games against Denver, uh, specifically uh, the game in which yeah. uh, the fumble game were. But I, and I think one thing that struck me the most about that the, the emotion that comes from football. And when you said that, you, that that a fan had sent you a letter that said you you ruined my dreams, and Marty Schottenheimer responded by that by saying. We would not have been in this game if we're not if not for Ernest Biner, and no one ever played as hard for me than Ernest Biner. I mean, that had to mean just a lot to you if you've gone back and watched that documentary. I mean, it just it was just real emotion. No, no question. And you know, Marty showed his emotions when when he was coaching us, and when he did that again in that particular clip, and the way he the way he sounded it out, the way it came from him, his voice was trembling. Uh, you know that's uh, that stuff that can break down pretty into any hard man. You know if he didn't feel that, that, you know from Marty, if he didn't feel that energy, if he didn't get choked up, you know you have to question the the love that he has for for fellow human beings. But you cannot question that when you look at Marty and you look at the way the, the way that he 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 sculptured us. Uh, to in, in the manner that he taught us to play the game and how he appreciated the game and taught us how to appreciate the game as well. When we uh, talked to a lot of former uh, Kansas City Chiefs who played under Marty Schottenheimer, they, they said he would touch all positions on the field. He, he came as a defensive guy, but he would go to the offensive guys. He'd go to any position that he thought he saw something wrong and could change. Was he doing that in Cleveland too, or is that something he developed later on? I think, uh, you know, initially, because Marty was a defensive coordinator, so initially he was, he would, he would, he would, he would hold us accountable in the, in like the Monday meetings after, you know, after Sunday games. But as the more he got adept or uh, uh, understood what we were doing offensively, the more he would, he would engage the offensive players. But for the most part, initially he, he was a defensive guy, head coach guy that held us and, and molded us in a way that, uh, that was that that was different, but he ne- he didn't necessarily do that with us initially. But as he as he got going, the more and more he could, he reached over and he he could, he, he found ways to definitely touch the offensive guys and also help with the offensive game plan. Well, I know. Um, obviously, Ernest, you went on and you and you won a Super Bowl with the Washington Redskins. You you played uh, in Baltimore. You've just had a wonderful NFL career. But uh, and it's you look back to um, to those AFC Championship games, and the Cleveland Browns haven't been the same since. Uh, I think they've only been to the playoffs twice since uh, since that '87 AFC Championship game, which is unbelievable. But as you look at the the, the, way yeah. the the current Browns franchise, I mean, it's just it's just got to be heartbreaking. I mean, obviously Cleveland did get the big championship with the Cavaliers um, with LeBron James, right. and it has to feel really good. But I mean, that city. It, it's it bleeds orange. It bleeds brown, man. What what would it, it mean does. for that city to get it turned around and to to finally get one in? Because they did. I mean, 1960, Jim Brown. I mean, it's just it's been so long. It needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. No question. Uh, I think you know the leadership there. I believe they are, they do understand that. But you know, Cleveland fans. Uh, you know, they you know they they went through the move. You know, which was which was heartrending, and you know, because you know, when you move a team uh, from a from a place like Cleveland, it's almost like losing a family member. So, ever since then, the football has really had it really hasn't been you know been what the Browns or Browns fans 
are looking for and, and what they actually, to, to be quite frank, what they are worthy of because of the loyalty, because of the season ticket, because they pass it down generationally from, you know, from dad, from granddad to, to, to grand, to son, to, to grandson. I mean, it's a family oriented, passed down generationally built uh, franchise and, you know, they're worthy of the other championship team and, you know, they, they, they're hopeful. They stay hopeful. Even, you know, even when it gets as it is now, it's, it's really difficult, you know, for us to, to see the franchise in, in, in the way that it is, especially after, you know, the, the type of success that we went through through the mid eighties and, but, you know, but not being able to hold that and continue that for the, for the, uh, city is very difficult to, to, to watch. But, you know, you know, that's only part of the story, you know. That's you know that's something that we can build on and build from, and hopefully that's what they're doing now is going through this process that they are continually to try to build from from the base that they have and try to get something that's really really worthy of the of the of, of being the Cleveland Brown, but also worthy for the fans. Yeah, I mean, probably have the number one pick. Hopefully they can get a franchise quarterback, hit on the quarterback, and then go from there. But uh, you were the first player to be inducted into the Ravens' Ring of Honor 2001, kind of the tie between the two cities of uh, Cleveland and Baltimore. Uh, What does that mean to you to be the first player inducted in their Ring of Honor? Well, it means that Mr. Modell uh, saw fit to 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 basically honor my my play in Cleveland more than more than my play in uh, with the Ravens was the connection with the Browns team and that was it that that that's was Mr. Mobile's team with the Browns and, and, and that's one of the things that he did for me and I you know, I and nobody told me this but this is how I feel is that it, it was it was basically a a bridging of the Browns and the Ravens, but also it, it, it shows some respect for the fact that we did come there, you know, and played in some of them in the first two seasons with the Ravens. But it's an honor for me. It's an honor for me to be inducted, to have been inducted, uh, and the first person that was put up there, even before Mr. Modell, and, and, and before they put his name, on that stadium. It's, I, I am really truly blessed and honored to be a part of that franchise and and, and even and, and as much as the Browns franchise. Well, Ernest, you had such a such a great career uh, in the NFL. Obviously, uh, what happened um, in Cleveland, what happened against the Denver Broncos, uh, that, that fumble certainly does not define a career. And that's what, uh, and watching the documentary Believe One, it just really uh, I immediately connected to you. I connected to Marty. I connected to the whole city of Cleveland as Chiefs fans. You yeah, know, we have we've experienced similar similar things. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. I know you've been around with you uh, played in, against the Chiefs many times. But uh, as a coach, yeah. as you moved on in your coaching career and uh, as running backs coach for several years in the NFL, what um, what influence did uh, did Marty Schottenheimer, ha- Schottenheimer have on you as as a coach as you finally uh, went back into into that field? And it, it was it was solely Marty that uh, that influenced me. The the early teachings that he that he gave me. Um, he actually tried to hire me up in Kansas City, um, but I wasn't quite ready to go full time in the coaching uh, after after the ninety seven season. But one of the things that Marty taught me that stuck with me uh, throughout my co- coaching career and stays with me today, and I tell and I tell aspiring coaches the same thing. Is to tell it to teach the same thing in as many different ways as you can. To teach, to be able to give examples of what you're trying to get across to players, because you never know what player would get or understand what you're teaching and which way that he'll grab it, because everybody learns a little bit different. That stood out to me. The other thing that stood out to me was the honesty that he that that, that he showed to me and to the team and the, and the accountability. All of those things I modeled in my coach in my coaching career. It was it was important to me to have integrity about what I was saying to the guys, but I also modeled exactly what he told me back in the day. Say this. Say what you're trying to say to the guys in as many different ways as you can so that you make sure that you get your message across. 
I love Marty for that. I love him for what he did for me. I love him for giving me the opportunity to also love the fact that he took time to treat me like a son. Yeah, Marty brought football just so much success to Cleveland, brought football back to Kansas City. Just everywhere, every stop he went, he made it a successful program. And we can't wait to have you be a part of this film uh, for Marty Schottenheimer. Sounds like you have so many great memories and he means so much to you just like he does us. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. And we, we, I look forward to sharing with you all. And, you know, we'll, we'll get a chance to maybe celebrate a man that has really touched a whole lot of people and a man that, that in, in, in my estimation, deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. No question about it, and we're uh, you know we're talking to so many former players, and really, um, and and we've got you and on our social media circle on our on our Facebook group for the for the film. So really, we're just trying to get everybody to to basically send in videos, you know, as from even from your cell phone, just a cell phone video of yourself talking about Marty. We're gonna put them all together, uh, put, and, and and see where it goes, and we're gonna get it to Marty in one way or another, um, and just so he'll he'll have that for his life because you know in football there's no other sport, there's no other walk of life that you form those kind of connections that are so lifelong lasting. And I think that's what's important about this. We want Marty to see that what uh, impact he's had on all of you guys. Uh, I, I, I love it. I love it. I'll, you know, I'll, uh, I'll take care of that. Hey, thanks a lot, Ernest. We will be in touch on this thing, man. We can't thank you enough for coming on to talk to us. We appreciate you taking the time. We'll be in touch, my man. Sounds good. Y'all have a good one. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks a lot. Happy Thanksgiving. And happy Thanksgiving to you all as well. Bye-bye. Huge thanks to Ernest Biner for coming on the show, being a part of this film. He's got so many great yeah. memories and so much emotion, and just he, he's proud of Marty, what he accomplished. He's so thankful for what Marty did for him and taught him and took into his own, his own coaching career later on down the road. So it's just going to be great to have him a part of this film. Uh, it really is, and Ernest is a guy that I've always been a fan of. I remember playing uh, Tecmo Super Bowl in the early yes. 90s with Ernest Biner at running back for the Redskins, mm -hmm. and that's where I, re where I really remember first hearing his name after uh, knowing that he was, of course, a Brown during the the, the formative years. The years that the Browns were good. I mean, the, the Browns haven't been good. They've been the playoffs twice since that 87 AFC Championship game. That's unbelievable. It is. I mean, just their fall from grace. I mean, having moved and taken the franchise to Baltimore and then coming, finally coming back, and they've just never been the same. They can't they could get the quarterback position right. I think it's 23 or 24 starting quarterbacks since, since they came back, and I believe 95. So it, it's just been a mess. Well, and I'll tell you what, uh, one, another thing I'm thankful for is we have a good friend. We have someone that means a lot to us here yes. on the Not For Long Pro Football Show. And I'll tell you what, it is Sean Salisbury. Your favorite, my favorite segment yes. on this show, Sean's Smack Unfiltered, and it's a Thanksgiving edition. Sean, what do you have for us this week, man? Happy Thanksgiving. Take it away. All right, guys. Uh, happy Thanksgiving weekend to everybody, and I hope it's a great one. And you're with family, friends, and loved ones, and having good drink and good vittles, and loving it, and uh, spending with the people you want to spend with. And obviously, football, family, friends, and loved ones is a pretty good thing. Um, I'm coming at you this week about Carson Palmer. Um, I'm an SC guy, so I love Carson. I think he's a spectacular talent. If you put him in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt and had all the guys line up in the league and you didn't know who they were and have them go throw, he'll throw it as good as anybody in the league. But I asked this question during on my show and to a person, an insider in Arizona, because I had Arizona as a Final Four team in the NFL this year going into the season. And so I asked an insider there, what about Carson Palmer – after what happened last year in the playoffs and the way they ended the season, can he overcome it um, mentally and emotionally? The, 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 it was just an, an, an awful run at the end. And if Larry Fitzgerald, the playoff game before they lost, doesn't bail him out with that great run, a couple costly throws at the end of the game would have cost him there as well. And he said, well, that's the question around here, but they think he can. Now, like I said, I love Carson Palmer. I love him as a person. And I think he's a hell of a thrower and a good football player. But when are we going to finally start to ask, ask the question, is he a big game player? Because it seems to me that there's a ceiling on how far he can take you. And this is a team that may have to start looking this year's draft for the heir apparent and the replacement. Because Carson Palmer, while he can rip it, and he's one hell of a dude, my question now is, and to Bruce Arians and the rest of the franchise, and they've got some money invested in him, can he overcome this and get him – winning in a big game in a playoff game or get them to the Super Bowl. From the looks of it, it looks like right now that stage gets too big for him, and it's a bummer for me to say, but until it's proved otherwise, I'm going to have to stick with that. I don't think Arizona's going to get there this year. Back to you guys, and happy Thanksgiving weekend. 
We salute you, Sean Salisbury. Thank you so much for being a part of this show. We are this thankful year. for that, that segment, all your unfiltered takes throughout the season and plenty more to come. Absolutely. We're going all the way to the Super Bowl with Sean. Yes. Uh, we're so glad to bring you him exclusively here on the Not For Long Pro Football Show, guys, on the Great American Sports Network, greatamericansportsnetwork.com. That's where you'll find all of it, my man. And as we go on, as we move in, we got some games, three games on Thursday. It's Thanksgiving. Time to settle in, eat. Whatever your choice is. I mean, do, do we, we're doing a non-traditional kind of Thanksgiving this year. I think we're going to go with uh, tailgate theme, tailgate food. Nice, nice. Okay, yeah. so prove of that. And yeah. um, and just settle in and watch all this unfold because I love uh, the football and Thanksgiving. It's, just, it's a huge part of it. Of course, you always got the Lions. You got the Cowboys. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Steelers, Colts. We don't know if Andrew Luck's going to play. He's got that concussion. So. Yeah. Uh, that could be tricky for the Colts going in there. They need that game to keep pace uh, with the Texans, although maybe they don't because the Texans keep losing games, and they're a horrible team anyway. They are, but looking to the NFC, uh, a team I've seen emerge, the Seattle Seahawks. Russell Wilson and that offense was dead early in the season. They had no identity. They, their identity used to be Marshawn Lynch, run the ball, work off play action, use Russell uh, Wilson's athleticism, yeah. get out of the pocket. Doug Baldwin has always been a key, but guess what? This offense is finding its stride. Even after cutting Christine Michael, they're yeah. starting to find its stride. And what they're being able to do, their defense, the way they brought it to New England, uh, the way they beat the Eagles this past weekend, I like what the Seahawks are doing. Are they legitimate? to contender uh, to the Dallas Cowboys in the NFC at this point. It's not if, it's when the Seahawks and Cowboys meet in the playoffs. And uh, I definitely think the Seahawks will have the Cowboys number. I like that. It's nice what Dak has going. It's That offensive line is great. It's nice what Ezekiel Elliott is doing. Probably better than nice. I could use a better word than that because they have been amazing, sensational to start off this season through 10 games. But uh, I don't see it. I see that Seahawks defense coming alive. And Russell Wilson, he's finally getting over that injury. He's mobile. He's running around. He's exiting the pocket. He's making plays downfield. Doug Baldwin is not an average receiver. He's out there making great plays. They found Jimmy Graham again. There was a Jimmy Graham sighting, and we found him again. He's just like he was in New Orleans. He's really coming on the scene. They do have problems at running back. You mentioned Christine Michaels gone. They have Thomas Rawls, C.J. Procise from Notre Dame. He's injured, so uh, Thomas Rawls, I don't know if he can be the workhorse guy they need. They need a one-two punch. Uh, so they do have problems in the run game, but I like the defense. I like Russell Wilson to carry him through to the Super Bowl, meeting the Patriots, a rematch of a couple years ago. Oh, Patriots rematch. So you don't believe still in the Oakland Raiders. Is that what you're telling me? No, no, not that defense. That offense is uh Amazing. It kind of sputters here and there. They have a lot of penalties. They are the Oakland Raiders. Uh, so the, because of that, penalties don't hold up in the playoffs. They have a lot of drops, too, for as much attention as Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree get. They do drop the ball a lot, and that was crucial, especially against the Texans. You saw that come to life and keeping the Texans in the game and having the lead late in the game. But uh, that defense and the drop balls, I think, will be the Raiders undoing and the penalties. And just they're not ready to be a real contender for a Super Bowl. They might be in the AFC Championship game. But they'll get blown out by the Patriots, and uh, they're just not ready for that yet. Well, and I'll tell you, Noah, uh, we've been talking all week. We know we've we've been talking not not all week, but for the better part of thirteen or fourteen years about our franchise, the Kansas City Chiefs. And Noah, I know that you're very passionate about some of your thoughts. I am as well. It's Thanksgiving. I know we don't want to necessarily go there, but Noah, you, I, I'm going to let you take this one because. The things we've been saying, what we've been talking about, I think it's very pertinent. Chiefs fans maybe need to hear this. I'm going to defer to you, and I'm going to say goodbye, and I'm going to say happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Noah, as you send us out, you've got a bigger picture segment for us that I think yeah, new we all need here. to hear. We call it the big picture, and I'm going with the Kansas City Chiefs. You know, one bad loss does not make a season, and overreactions are commonplace after every week, when in reality, they're simply a snapshot of one game in a long season. However, these Kansas City Chiefs have shown us all season long that they're rarely ready to start a game and that this offense is not getting any better. To this day, Alex Smith remains a polarizing quarterback with his defenders mentioning names such as Trent Dilfer or Brad Johnson. I assure you that this Chiefs defense is no 2000 Ravens nor the 2002 Bucks. If that defense doesn't work for you, they'll name Joe Flacco or Eli Manning wildcard teams whose quarterbacks caught fire, leading them to Super Bowl wins. Well, I assure you that Alex Smith is not capable of going off like they did. And if those two defenses don't work for you, they'll bring out Ben Roethlisberger, Russell Wilson, Peyton Manning, quarterbacks whose defenses catapulted them to their Super Bowl victories. Well, this Chiefs defense is not as dynamic or dominant as those, and Alex Smith just does not bring enough to the table to make up for that. 
especially right now if he's too gun-shy to rely on his best attribute after those big hits in Indianapolis, and that's his mobility. But this is the hand we are dealt, and crazy, strange things have happened in sports. Lynn Elliott, a great field goal kicker. He missed three field goals in the playoffs for the Chiefs, and he's never been seen or heard from again. The Chiefs choose Elvis Gerbach over Rich Gannon. I think we all know how that turned out. What about the 2003 Chiefs offense, who couldn't outdo their defense, who wasn't one of the worst, but the worst defense in the NFL at the time? And then there was three-time Executive of the Year, Scott Pioli, who immediately hitched his wagons to Matt Castle, bombed at the draft, and hired Romeo Cornell as his head coach. A lot of bad, strange things have happened for the Chiefs, but I think it's time that some good, strange things happen. Like how about this 2016 Chiefs team winning the Super Bowl? Till next time, I'm Noah Groniger, telling you to remember the big picture.